His name is Jean-Marie Apostolides, professor of French literature here at Stanford. Many of you out there will remember him from a show we did a few years back on Albert Camus, which remains one of my all-time favorite shows. Jean-Marie has devoted some significant time to Ked- Ted Kaczynski. In 1996, he published a French translation of Kaczynski's Manifesto, Industrial Society and Its Future, with a 60-page introduction. Later on, in July 1996, after Kaczynski had been arrested, he published a book about him called L'Affaire Una Bombère. Is that how you would say it in French, Jean-Marie? Yes. L'Affaire Una Bombère. This uh, next month, I think in October, he'll be coming out with a new book, including his French translation of Industrial Society and Its Future, as well as an anti-industrial manifesto uh, that doesn't have a title, that Kaczynski wrote it back in 1971. Jean-Marie is also finishing a study tentatively called Theodore Kaczynski, Écrivain et Terroriste, which considers him, above all, as a writer. Jean-Marie, welcome to the program. Thank you, Robert, for inviting me to your program. I think it's fair to say that you would not be spending so much time translating and writing about the Unabomber were you not in some sense fascinated by him. What exactly is it that fascinates you about Ted Kaczynski, if anything? I don't know if the term fascinates is the most appropriate one. However, there is certainly something which, at the beginning, was very amazing for me. In our academic profession, one of the most aspects of our work is to publish. Each of us has encountered difficulties to publish, but nobody as far as I know, has ever killed in order to have his or her book published. And I think at the beginning, it was the fact that Kaczynski would kill in order to have his book published, and that it was written in his manifesto that he had purposely killed people in order to have his ideas known by many people, which probably, quote-unquote, fascinated me. That gives a new twist to the term publish or perish. (laughs) Also, on our previous show on Albert Camus, you said that uh, Gallimard, the son of Gallimard, who was in the car with Albert Camus, uh, fulfilled the secret subconscious uh, fantasy of every publisher, which is to kill the author, no? Yes. But this uh, is a different kind of uh, Yes, this is a... uh, Yes, but beyond uh, your uh, joke, which I like a lot... Um, it means that there is probably somewhere a link between writing and uh, death and the problem of death. I don't know what it is exactly, but I suspect there is a link between the two. I remember when the um, Industrial Society and its Future was first published in the New York Times and Washington Post in 96, I believe it was. Yes, uh, you and I were both... 95. 95, right. He was arrested in 96 a few months later. But he, you were quite fast... We were both very taken with the content of this uh, manifesto and its uh, strident critique of technology. And, of course, while it probably never would have met the kind of academic standards for publication because of the stylistic idiosyncrasies, he was expressing ideas about our technological society that uh, seemed to have a freshness insofar as they were completely direct, they were not qualified, and they seemed to go to the heart of a certain malaise in our civilization. And uh, you certainly had found some resonance in that manifesto with some of your own sociological um, critiques of our technological civilization. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I have... uh been always interested in extremist and avant-garde ideas, which does not mean that I share these ideas, but I admit that I find interest in extremist ideas, such as, for example, the ideas expressed by the situationists during the 60s and the 70s. 
when the, uh, Ted Kaczynski's uh, uh, manifesto appeared in the Washington Post, uh, it had many connections with the way of writing that the situationist had used for years and years. And it has no direct link between the two because I doubt that uh, Kaczynski has ever heard of the situationist movement. But the reciproc uh, is not true because now the pro-situationist people have a lot of knowledge of Kaczynski's work and they have retranslated his manifesto. Well, to make a long story short, uh, the connection between these two extremist groups, uh, I found it very interesting, except that uh, the situationist, even if they proclaim themselves to be revolutionary, stayed within the dominant society, where, whereas Kaczynski put himself outside the dominant society and in a certain way was more faithful to his own ideas and uh, kept them or maintained them at a level of consistency which is almost unbelievable in our society. Would you agree that had Kaczynski not revealed himself to have been someone who was uh, in, in Bodied, incarnated in his own existential choices of living in the wilderness in a little shack uh, and who had not adopted a lifestyle consistent with its ideas, that these ideas would not have nearly the same sort of suasion that they have um, as a result of his choice for uh, in, in favor of, of living this kind of quasi-wild life. In other words, many theorists have had ideas similar and more sophisticated than Kaczynski's but perhaps don't have the same sort of immediate claim to authenticity because they are not lived out. That If a university professor, for example, will have a very hard time getting similar ideas as Kaczynski uh, um, read and disseminated because of the existential choice. No? I totally agree with you. If we can take an example, for example, Jacques Ellul, whose work had an enormous influence on Ted Kaczynski, remained within our society. So he wrote several books against uh, technocracy and uh, <coughs> technology in our society. But his book never had the same impact that uh, Kaczynski's uh, uh, book, uh, Industrial Society and Its Future. And that is definitely due to the fact that Kaczynski lived in a uh, wild environment for so many years. And as uh, basically what he has done, he has, he, he has created a link between his writing and his social practice. Right. Whether we like it or not, it is a fact that we have to discuss, probably. Yes, certainly. And I would imagine that <clears throat> the writings, we can talk about this later, but the writings that he might um, deliver in prison will be of less interest just because of the fact that he is not any longer in this wild environment as an outlaw. He doesn't speak with the authority of an outlaw, if I can use an oxymoron. No, exactly. Now he's more. Uh, he, 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 he writes a lot. He exchanges a lot with many correspondents. And what uh, I can say about his current writing is that it's more likely something more academic. He discusses academic yeah. books and academic uh, uh, ideas. Well, certainly when he was arrested, there were those dramatic photos of him being uh, taken away by policemen all in their uniforms and he looked with his long hair his long beard and his bandana he had the look of a hermit he had the look of a saint he had the, the look of an almost holy man vis-a-vis -vis these other people who, representing the law and there was a certain charisma in the persona that I think lent uh, a shade of, of, of uh, authority to, to, to that uh, manifesto that we that we read but nevertheless let me just state some of the facts of what he was accused of and then later indicted of uh, in all 16 bombs that he sent which injured 23 people and killed three people they were at least attributed to Kaczynski and um, he ended up 
pleading guilty in order to spare himself the death sentence. And uh, I know that maybe he wants to revisit that plea bargain, but we don't want to get into the legal issues, at least not now. What we would like to do is probe what are the central ideas, particularly of the industrial future and its um, and its future. So uh, it's, as we mentioned, it's a critique of technology, but very important frame for his critique of technology is his critique of the over-socialization that people in our society are subjected to. And he interprets contemporary, especially academic leftism, as a symptom of this over-socialization. What does he mean by that? Probably the intellectual background of Kaczynski's ideas is the conception of human beings going back to 18th and 19th century uh, European thinking. For him, the ideal is the individual who is in control of his or her own fate and who is capable of surviving in a state of nature which is hostile to human beings. And he has been himself living like that for more than 18 years. Whereas he considers that contemporary society, a society in which we are connected to everyone through technology, has weakened our capacity to survive and to achieve what he calls the power process. That means a human accomplishment of our different potentialities, both physical and intellectual. And he targets the left or the so-called left in academic milieu to show that instead of developing a sort of Nietzschean conception of humanity, they are more attracted by the victimization side of our life. They are always on the side of the victim because they project themselves on the victim. So his accusations are twofold. On one side, he argues that far from being rebel, these people are obedient citizens of dominant society. And second, far from creating liberation for human beings, their discourse, their way of behaving force people to be even more dependent of the big technological machine. And on this aspect, at least, his ideas deserve to be discussed. Well, would you say that his criticism that leftists are always taking the side of victims is part of the fact that they, as leftists, are trying to, as he argues, compensate for their lack of personal power, of their disempowerment by the technological society through over-socialization, and therefore they f themselves feel victimized but are not expressing it directly. And if I can quote from, you know, the manifesto there, he, uh, when he, he's talking about leftism as a movement uh, of people who are over-socialized, he says, the moral code of our society is so demanding that no one can think, feel, and act in a completely moral way. Some people are so highly socialized that the attempt to think, feel, and act morally imposes a severe burden on them in order to avoid feelings of guilt, they continually have to deceive themselves about their own motives and find moral explanation for feelings and actions that in reality have a non-moral origin. Uh, we use the term over-socialized to describe such people. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that when people like you and I read that, we think of F Friedrich Nietzsche, we think of uh, Freud, we think of all the great tradition of the hermeneutics of suspicion, that is suspicious of people's avowed motives and goals and tries to penetrate to a different, uh, unconfessed, unavowed source of motivations. And he uh, s seems to fall into this genealogy of 
suspicious thinkers, no? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree with you. He, he has certainly points the finger on something very important uh, in the unconscious of our own civilization, if I may use the term unconscious. But uh, at the same time, it seems to me that this particular point is something which concerned him also, because given the education he has received, given the moral values uh, which have been transmitted by his family to him and to his younger brother David, it was probably what he described in the paragraph you have just read is probably the sort of model that he was induced to follow by his milieu and he rebelled violently against this same milieu and in order to distance himself from this model. But he would not make such a generalization if this model of uh, over-socialized people would not be somewhere something he has been induced himself to follow. Right, I agree with that. So do you think he is or was ultimately a creature of ressentiment? Yes. Yeah. In, in, the, uh, in the meaning you are using the term, yes, yes. So let me ask you this question about his victims, because one thing I've never understood about uh, Kaczynski's m motivation is the choice and selection of his victims. When you look um, at, who, at who he sent bombs to, it doesn't seem to me like he targeted the great villains of our society and the people that some, some of us might uh, actually secretly cheer if they were to get a hand blown off because they're not the, uh, they're not the uh, les salauds. They're people like, you know, a campus police officer a graduate student at Northwestern University, uh, some passengers on an American Airlines. There's a secretary, a university secretary, a professor, another graduate student. There's there's a, a store, a computer store owner, two computer store owners actually, and then there's geneticists and and so forth. The victims seem not to be, uh, you know, these great um, villains that we would automatically suspect. Why did he choose this? bizarre set of characters to send bombs to. Mm -hmm. uh, before I answer your question, uh, permit me to say something on the microphone. The fact that I neither share the ideas of Ted Kaczynski nor his method. And I totally disagree with his method. And that has to be said from the beginning. Otherwise, uh, our listener runs the risk of associating me as an individual to uh, this guy. And I, I don't want it to be the case. It seemed to me that... Uh, I, I agree with you. These were not the target one true revolutionary should have chosen. But bear in mind that he was alone. He had more access to these people because he knew their address. He knew how to reach them. And for them, for him, they were a sort of target. But he's very intelligent. I am sure he thought that they were not real target. The, uh, and they would not change anything. It seems to me that in this respect, he had more in mind to be notified as a criminal and maybe to prove himself that he was capable of becoming a criminal rather than being someone really useful in the revolutionary dimension. In other words, I am sure he probably knew that his crimes would not change anything dramatically in our society, but that they would permit his ideas to be known by many people. Mm -hmm. He obviously believed that the dissemination of his ideas would make a difference, no? That, yes, and this is what he wanted. And this is where he's profoundly self-deceived, I, I would argue, because his ideas have made very little difference in the political realm of things. 
Well, definitely, since, since he wrote his manifesto, the power of technology has totally increased to yeah. the point where uh, it is so embedded in human life now that we can speak of ourselves as a new generation of human beings in which the technological uh, aspect is inscribed in our own body. Absolutely, and and for years on this show, I've been uh, you know decrying the fact that we're becoming the Borg, and a prosthetic species, a kind of uh, between the synthetic and the and the organic. And this is where Kaczynski. I have if I have sympathy w with some of his ideas, I have sympathy when he says, and I quote him where he predicts that if the system succeeds in acquiring sufficient control over human behavior quickly enough, it will probably survive. Otherwise, it will break down. Now, he thought that by publishing his ideas, he was going to contribute to the breakdown of the system. But the reality, I think I agree with you, is that since his arrest, the, uh, the system has succeeded in, in acquiring such control over human behavior that not only will it survive, it is actually thriving. Absolutely. And that we are no longer even barely conscious of the fact that technology is our ur master, in, uh, that it's, it's insinuated itself into our human relations, into our relations uh, with our bodies, with the earth, with other species, with uh, knowledge. In every possible sphere of human activity and reflection, Technology has already colonized the frame or has given the frame within which we're allowed to operate. I think Kaczynski is right about that. Mm -hmm. I don't see any danger of that system collapsing anytime soon. Me neither. I think that when he wrote uh, in 1995 and published his manifesto, it was already too late. But what this manifesto has done in the intellectual milieu is to make us aware of the sense where our civilization is going. And uh, for us, who are in a certain way the children of Marx, we thought that economy was the driving force in our society. It seems to me that with people like Jacques Ellul or Ted Kaczynski, we understand now that economy is not any longer the driving force in the development of our society, but this is definitely technology. And as such, the existence of Kaczynski is crimes on one side, but his reflection and analysis on the other side are very important for us to understand where we are going and to, to foresee the kind of future that we already have, which is already here, and that we did not want lucidly. In that respect, his manifesto helped us to, to be more aware of the di direction our society is taking currently. Oh. The difference I have uh, you know, of opinion, if you want to call it opinion or analysis with Kaczynski, is that he, for him it was either the survival and complete hegemony of the system or its collapse. And therefore one had to be a revolutionary in order to precipitate the total collapse of the system. Whereas I don't think that that is either... Uh, likely, or do I consider it desirable, a total collapse, namely a kind of return to a state of nature of the war of all against all, but rather finding ways to keep open uh, alternatives, uh, you know, within the reality of modern technology and to create little spaces that I continue to refer to as little gardens in the midst of the wasteland uh, because they can go a long way. Uh, in, in terms of a different kind of survival, psychological survival rather than mm -hmm. material survival that he was so interested in. So. Uh, I, for one, am also very suspicious about any extreme solution such as revolution. So uh, I did not think either it was something desirable. L let's say that I if you permit me to speak a little bit about my own ideas, I understand that technology, to a certain extent, is governing more and more aspects in our life. But it seems also to me that each 
new civilization, and definitely we are in a new civilization, creates on one side its own negativity, but also its own condition of freedom. That means in a totally technological society such as the one we are creating currently, we have to invent, to create our new condition of freedom, which are very different from the 18th or 19th century situation of our uh, founding father uh, living in the frontier and so on. But that does not mean we are totally the slave of this technological situation. We are not totally passive in front of technology, which is a human creation. And we have to be aware of the danger in order to create new conditions for liberty and freedom, except that it won't be the same freedom situation as it was even at the time of uh, my birth in 1945. Yeah. Well, that's where I think that your ideas are much more interesting than Kaczynski's on this issue, because for Kaczynski, it was uh, dichotomously black or white. It was either total enslavement in the system, or it was this wilderness child outside of society living in a shack and learning material survival skills in a, in a complete wilderness, trying to invent the new spheres of freedom within the context of a given historical reality is a much more difficult challenge than to try to bring about impossible and feckless revolutions that are, can only happen in someone's mind and not actually translate into reality. So um, thank you for saying that. I, I would like to raise this um, issue of, of his division of human... Uh, well, what interests me about Kaczynski is also his notion that human beings that there's a certain formula for human happiness and that most people do not formulate or do, they, they do not actually uh, take full cognizance of what will make them happy and that oftentimes the technology we're creating, as you said, the society we're making or the scientific, scientific research that we're pursuing, to, we're not in control of the goals that they're heading towards. And so, for example, he divides human drives into three groups. You remember that, where... He says that there are those drives that can be satisfied with minimal effort. I'm hungry. I go to the supermarket. I buy, you know, my food. Minimal effort to satisfy that drive. Then there are those that can be satisfied, but only at the cost of serious effort, becoming a professor, getting your Ph.D., whatever kind of uh, truly earned uh, achievement. And then there are those drives that cannot be adequately satisfied no matter how much effort one makes. And he says that the power process, what gives people a sense of freedom and, and empowerment, is the process of satisfying the drives of the second group. And I believe he's correct in mm -hmm. that. But then he goes on to claim that in, the, in our modern industrial society, natural human drives tend to be pushed into the first and third groups, and the second group tends to consist increasingly of artificially created drives. Uh, and he says that among those are surrogate activities directed towards an artificial goal that people set up for themselves merely in order to have some goal to work towards. And I believe that this is a very intelligent analysis of what maybe Jean-Paul Sartre would call, you know, the mauvaise foi mm -hmm. of, you know, projecting goals which are not, not coming from myself, which even if I were to attain would not bring me happiness, but they just keep the illusion that I have purpose in my life, whereas my life might not have any purpose whatsoever. It's just a, a veneer of purpose. But it is his own vision, because, for, for example, he, he defined as surrogate activities the desire for knowledge. It is probably his case. This is uh, an academic. He got a PhD in mathematics, as we know. He has been uh, an assistant professor in one of the best uh, American universities, yeah. Berkeley. And he did not like... Uh, <clears throat> this sort of life. He did not want to have this sort of academic life. But uh, I, I, for one, do not consider that our drive for understanding the universe in which we live today is a surrogate activity. For me, it is linked to our body. We need to understand the sort of universe in which we are. Our ancestors tried to understand the, uh, 
à our universe starting with the earth, our relationship to the sun. Today, with technology, we have a totally different view of what the universe is. In my view, it is not a surrogate activity. It is a strong inscribed in human body desire drive to understand the life we have. So, in a certain way, Kaczynski, who is not always aware of the impact of his own education on his ideas, project onto everybody his own personal view so that everything which appears to him to be a surrogate activity, we are not forced to share this perspective, and uh, uh, I don't. I agree with you that a lot of activities in the realm of knowledge are not surrogate activities in the way he understands them. For example, our desire to know the origins of the cosmos or our desire to know ourselves through probing. And s However, I have claimed several times on this show that there is a great deal of scientific research which does not fall under the category of this wonder and, and natural curiosity to know the world we live in and to know ourselves better, but that when he says, and I quote, that science marches on blindly without regard to the real welfare of the human race or to any other standard, standard obedient only to the psychological needs of the scientists and of the government officials and corporate executives who provide the funds for their research, a great deal of scientific research that takes place right here in our own academic home Uh, and in universities around the world is is of this sort, I think. I, I agree with you, but it's very difficult within the academic environment to seem to criticize most of our colleagues and to place ourselves outside the circle. So this is why I am hesitating publicly to agree with you, but basically you know that I share your opinion. Well, you know, it reminds me of what Hegel said in The Phenomenology of Spirit, which is that the one of the deepest drives or motivations of human uh, behavior and human achievement is a desire for recognition. Mm -hmm. And he said that men of knowledge, philosophers, scientists above all, that they are not motivated by a disinterested uh, search for knowledge. They are mo motivated primarily for the desire for recognition. You know how many of our colleagues here at Stanford just wait for that phone call from the Nobel Prize Committee that is going to crown you know, their their work of, of years and years. I mean, it's probably a noble goal, but the desire for recognition is a very different motivation than maximizing the welfare of the human race. Yeah. And oftentimes, you know, scientific research is conducted for the former and not the latter. Okay, Robert, but this desire for recognition belongs to the human nature or even animal nature. Na uh, animals do need to recognize one another, and it's the same for us. We need a sort of recognition. Uh, uh, I don't well, that's see fine. that. As, as long as animals can remain animals. But when scientists now are starting to change a mouse into a rat or a cat into a dog through genetic manipulation of, the, of their... Uh, Uh, of their genome, then, then I, I, I figure that one has to tell the scientists, are you doing this because you really want to save the life of that innocent baby that one, one's always invoking? Or are you doing this because uh, it's, it's that thing which will get you the next you know, piece of recognition? No, this is true. This is a negative aspect of, the, uh, of science, and this is a price to pay to have also a knowledge of yeah. what the genome is. Right. Definitely. Well, in any case, that's... Uh, that you, ca you cannot have, Robert, the, neg the positive side without having at the same time the negative side. So I agree with that. But if I accept that as a, as a foregone conclusion, then I say I have to accept the technological society with all its virtues and all its vices. And therefore, I have to get out of the business of trying to point out what are its vices as opposed to its virtues, and to address the question of its vices. You know, people sometimes misunderstand on this show that, uh, that I'm anti-scientific. Not at all. I mean, science is one of the most noble enterprises. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that one ha has to just be on either you're with us or against us. You're either for science or you're against science. No. There are certain things in scientific activity and research that uh, one can also look at with a certain suspicion. And I think Kaczynski can help 
Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Show us this. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And on that respect, uh, whatever we may think uh, of the man, we need to read and to, to pass to our students his manifesto because it's an important text. So what I other ideas for you, jean Madi, are the most important in his corpus that we should address? Beyond the, um, the ideas on technology and his a sociological description of contemporary society, a society where the role of victimization ultimately weakens uh, not only the victim but all human beings. The other aspect of Kaczynski's work which uh, interested me was the personal aspect, the psychological aspect. Uh, uh, the education that he has received, his frustration during his life, and uh, above all, his conception of writing. You mentioned in your introduction that uh, currently uh, I am working on uh, him as a writer, and it seems to me, after I read many texts, many interviews he has given, I even read his uh, autobiography, which has not been published. I think that from the beginning, he should be considered as a writer, a very special writer, but a writer. Bear in mind that over the years, he has uh, written a diary, which is almost 20,000 pages, a diary which is basically written in English, but some parts are written in Spanish. And some other parts are coded in such a secret code that it was extremely difficult for the FBI to understand what he had written. And they found the key in his shack, otherwise they probably would not have understood what he meant. He has written even literary text. He has written one important uh, philosophical book, which is uh, Industrial Society and Its Future. He has written at least two, if not three, different autobiographies. So basically, his real vocation is to be a writer. And one of our problems in our society is that when we write, we want our book, for which we have worked so many years, to have a certain impact. And basically, in most of the cases, except few people, our words have no meaning. They bear no power. They will change nothing. They will be uh, seen at best as a divertissement, as a pleasure, even a pleasure of intelligence, but nothing more than that. Our words do not have any longer the power to change society. Kaczynski was obsessed by this form of, of almost religious writing by which a book can change human life. And in my view, this is probably the main reason why he killed someone, because he wanted his word or his pen to be associated not with ink, like your pen or my pen, but with blood, in order to have words which were so strong, so uh, powerful, that they would change the real. So I said it's almost a religious attitude because bear in mind that even if he is an atheist and has been raised in an atheist family, his family was from a Catholic origin. And he still maintains, even if he does not know it, a certain Catholic conception of the words. When the priest takes the host and says, pronounce the sacred words, hoc est enim corpus, these words have the power to transform the host into the body of Christ. So it is an extremely powerful capacity with some special words to transform the universe into something different. And this is what he wanted to have and this is the revolution he wanted. He knew he was alone. He knew basically that nobody would follow him. But he expected that associating words 
with blood, these words would be strong enough to transform reality, to change the course of our society in order to make something different. Of course, it's totally crazy and it is totally irrelevant if you think about it. But at the same time, my question to you and to me also is this one. Is this secret dream of Kaczynski, is it not a part of our own dream as writer? Don't we want to have the greatest intellectual figure in the 20th century? Think of Jean-Paul Sartre, for example, Albert Camus, Jacques Lacan, many other There's people. There are also some that aren't French. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm sorry, Robert, for this, for this nationalism. Please, people who listen to me, excuse me for being so French. But, I, I mean, the, the great in the intellectuals have always wanted their words to create something new. The founding father in America, this is what they've done. Uh, uh, and it is in this dimension that we have to evaluate Kaczynski's crazy enterprise. Well, I have two questions for you then. One is, if his true vocation was not to be a murderer, not to be a, a, you know, a wild man in the forest, but to be a writer, first question, do you think he was a good writer? Second question, with this radical uh, proto or, or post-Catholic uh, desire to transubstantiate the word into action or into history, do you think that that is a, the, the, uh, you know, the belief of a sane man? So is he a good writer? Was he sane from a clinical point of view? In, I, I, in, I, I use them in the, I'm using the past tense. I should use the present tense. But yeah. you know. In both cases, and of course, this is my personal judgment, the answer is no. He's not a good writer because today we are not anymore in a society where we have an impact through a religious method, but rather through aesthetics. And as far as aesthetics is concerned, no, he does not write uh, very well. He's... Uh, um, Writing is very often schematical, and by no means it could be compared to Mark Twain, for example, who is a master of the American language. Second, is he sane? It's extremely difficult to have a final judgment, but in my view, no. In my view, no. He had many problems from the beginning, an extremely difficult relationship to his parents, particularly to his mother, a very bizarre relationship to his brother David, a difficulty to be in touch and in contact with other human beings, with male on one side, having difficulty to be friends, uh, his colleagues, and with female. This is a man who, is, who was and still is today very handsome, very intelligent. He has been unable to find a girlfriend for himself when he had everything he could, a good job at Berkeley, a very handsome and attractive uh, body, and a guy who was well-read and very intelligent. And yet, he was alone. One uh, of his great failures, and he knows it, is the fact that he has been incapable of sharing his life with a sweet girlfriend, having a family and having babies, which was one of his dreams. So all that refers to an extremely complex, difficult uh, uh, psychological relationship with other people. It's very difficult to draw a line between someone who is sane and totally insane, but I would lean in the case of uh, uh, Theodor Kaczynski on the side of the unsane, if not insane. And in my view, if he had been more sane, 
he probably would not have killed and he would have spent his time uh, improving his writing. And hanging out with girls. Probably, <laughs> yes. So this loneliness, this profound loneliness and estrangement from others that characterizes his entire adult life, even as a Berkeley professor, apparently he was pathologically shy even in front of students. He got terrible student evaluations. The, maybe it was a question of compensation, but he was very, very close with his brother David for a while in his life, no? And his younger brother idolized him and loved him and, and looked up to him. And this uh, intimacy that he had with David was one that then he became estranged from his brother. He cut off all relations with his family. But I'm very intrigued by the figure of David, the brother, because it was finally David who recognized, after the manifesto was published in the Washington Post, who uh, recognized that this was the work of his brother. He recognized the style and the ideas from previous things, letters that he had written to David and so forth. And from everything we know, David agonized over what to do. But, of course, he did... He, he tried before turning in his brother to make sure that he would get the FBI not to pursue a death penalty, that he himself would remain anonymous as the source and so forth. And while everyone was talking of, about Ted Kaczynski as the saint figure in this whole drama, for me, you know, there's something saintly about David Kaczynski and his behavior, not only in the question of the arrest, but afterwards, how he's still going around with some of the victims of Ted Kaczynski talking about reconciliation, giving all the money he makes, you know, to the families of the victims and so forth. He he seems like a, a truly uh, decent, if not profoundly moral individual. But do you have any view on that? Y uh Yes, uh, it is true that uh, it was probably an agonizing decision for David to denounce his brother. He recognized the ideas that was expressed in the manifesto written in 1971. And uh, under the guidance of uh, David's uh, wife, Linda, uh, David went to the, indirectly to the FBI and to say that he suspected his brother to be the Unabomber. Uh, th that is true, but uh, um, David certainly does incarnate our own moral values today. At the origin, David was totally in admiration with his brother and wanted to be like his brother. And he went out in the solitude for years and years uh, like his brother. But at the moment or immediately after he denounced his brother to the police, that permitted him to reinstate himself in the dominant society. So he changed. He moved from loneliness to civilization. He married his girlfriend. Today, he is very much involved in community work. He gives lectures on his brother or on different topics. And in a certain way, he has taken the place of Theodore. Theodore now is in the shadow Whereas at the origin, Theodore was constantly in the light. He was a bright guy. He was a guy who had succeeded in his studies. He was a very intelligent guy. And David was nothing. Today, curiously enough, David is something. He becomes important for us. He is seen as generous, as, uh, as someone who has done something exceptional. Whereas Theodore is the villain, he's in jail, in the shadow. And uh, I, I would like to add something. Uh, as I said, in uh, 1998, uh, Kaczynski, Theodore Kaczynski wrote his own autobiography. And he speaks a lot about his relationship to his brother in this autobiography. And he said that he will never forgive his brother David for betraying him when he thought that his brother was always 
on his side. But he also says, I will forgive him under one condition, that he divorce his spouse, he leaves civilization, he goes back to the shack in Texas where he lived, and he lives in loneliness for the rest of his life. So in a certain way, Theodor Kaczynski describes his brother as a Judas who has betrayed the Christ, and he sees himself as a Christ figure. That says a lot about his unconscious cultural conception yeah. of his work. I know what I may say here is, is shocking because for us, Theodor Kaczynski is a criminal, if not a serial killer. But I wanted to report what I read in his autobiography, yeah. and that also should be taken into consideration. For me, that's another confirmation that he had all the instincts of a tyrant, as I mentioned in my introduction, because this idea that he would only f forgive his brother on this one condition, that he go and uh, be the duplicate, the inferior duplicate of himself, is a act of arrogance and of presumption and of a lack of generosity in terms of the relation to his brother. And this inability to forgive shows that he's not a true Catholic at, at heart. <laughs> you know, he might have been obsessed with transubstantiation, but... Uh, uh, but the, not with Christ, Christ's last word, uh, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are they, doing. They, yeah. They, yeah. I don't know what is the term in English. Uh, but. Uh, forgive them for they know not what they do. Okay, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, and, of course, David asked for forgiveness for his brother Ted, not only legally, but probably also, you know, morally and from the public, because the spirit of forgiveness, he, he knew that his brother was probably not responsible for his actions and that he should be spared the death penalty and so forth. I mean, talking about forgiveness, it's on the side, I think, of, of David, not on Ted. One last question uh, before we close the program, Jean-Marie. We've been speaking here, by the way, with Professor Jean-Marie Apostolides on KZSU Stanford uh, about Ted Kaczynski, the so-called Unabomber. He, all the work you've done, most of the work you've done on the Unabomber has been in French and translating him into Fr French. There seems to be a huge interest in this figure in France. It, why is that? Four different f French translation appeared in France. It seems to me that he has been a role model for the extreme left is, in a certain way, a role model for this revolutionary left who has no more figure and ideal to present. Also, Ted Kaczynski is much closer to the anarchist of the end of 19th century in Chicago or in Paris. Yet, the post-68 revolutionary movement in France which is at the same time so important and so weak because it has no realistic program, found in Kaczynski its role model. And this is why, very likely, he's someone extremely popular in France. Well, that's good. I'm sure your uh, new book that's going to come out shortly will do very well in France. Thanks for coming on again, Jean-Marie. It's been a pleasure as usual. And uh, w there are plenty of other topics that we're going to get you back on to discuss. Thank you, Robert, for having and, me once more. And thank you all for listening to Entitled Opinions. We'll be with you shortly.